Welcome back everyone for another Cobra Kai watch party. We do all sorts of world-class analysis here, but in addition to analyzing the themes and characters, I occasionally like to dig under the hood and look at some of the nuts and bolts. That is to look at the quality of the writing and directing. In my previous video, I took a long breakdown of the roller rink sequence from season two, episode eight, and why I thought it was so well done. I do recommend you watch that video when you get a chance. Today we are looking at Season 3, Episode 7, Obstaculous. Specifically Sam's storyline in this episode, but we'll touch on some other parts as well. Now as far as Season 3 goes, you probably don't think this is the worst episode. Most people probably rank Episode 3 the lowest, where the stakes are lower, or maybe one of the later episodes. But however you rank the episodes, I do think Episode 7 has the weakest script. Think of the story as broadly what happens in the episode. Johnny is setting up his new dojo, Miguel is back at school, Sam and Daniel are having their adventure, that's all the story. When I say the script is weak, I'm referring to how these scenes actually play out. The way the story is realized, what they're saying and how it flows. It's worth noting the directing and the performance all play into this too, but for now we're mostly going to focus on the script. It's weak. Now to explain why, we need to take a deep step back and think about what it is we're watching. It's a show, but more importantly, this is drama. The root of all drama is conflict. It's the conflict that tends to make drama interesting to watch. Thus, it is an iron rule that in drama, every scene needs conflict. Even scenes where you don't think there's conflict, there's actually conflict. Also, you don't necessarily need two people for there to be conflict. The conflict could come from the environment, or it could be internal conflict. It could also be conflict with another character who isn't currently present. The driving force of all conflict is the individual character motivation. That essentially means what does the character want? What is the person after? In Cobra Kai, sometimes this is very easy. That is when people are fighting each other. He wants to beat him up. He wants to beat him up. They want to beat them up. These two want to beat them up. Dimitri doesn't want to get hit, but let's take a look where they aren't fighting. Here, Daniel wants Johnny to give up this whole Cobra Kai thing. Johnny wants Daniel to go away and leave him alone. So you have two characters whose motivation is different. This gap here, this difference in what they want is the conflict. You can imagine their wants as pushing against each other through the dialogue. Watch. What do you think you're doing? Promoting my business. Why don't you try minding yours? Minding mine? You, you know what? Look, this is, this is ridiculous, okay? We can both be adults here. I just don't know why you'd ever want to bring back Cobra Kai after what your sensei did to you. Except in this scene, Daniel also wants to prevent his daughter from swallowing a lesson on oral sex in a high school classroom. Since he wants that more, he takes off and Johnny wins. That's an important point. You can often find a winner of a scene. It's not the winner of a fight, but the one whose want or motivation pushes through at the end, into the climax of the scene. Keep in mind there is conflict from clashing motivation even when they appear to be in lockstep. In this scene, Johnny wants to convince Miguel he is the coolest, most badass karate sensei. Miguel wants to know how good at karate he can really get. The gap here is small. It seems like what they want complement each other. There's no major conflict, but it's still there. Watch. Just be thankful you're not a sumo wrestler. Those guys have to wipe their sensei's asses. So I uh, see you're a karate champion, sensei. Yeah, I won a couple All-Valley tournaments. Didn't lose a single point in my junior year. All right. What happened your senior year? This isn't 20 questions. Get back to scrubbing. So even though it doesn't necessarily seem like there's conflict in the scene, it's still driving the action. That's what makes good drama. I could break down the motivations and conflict for each character in every scene. Once you learn how to analyze the drama, it becomes like second nature. This all assumes the script is well written. Luckily, Cobra Kai tends to be very well written. Actually, the big three seem to have strong instincts on creating conflict between characters. This all brings us to here. This is the meat of Sam's story, the big moments. It's also the weakest part of the script. What's holding this back is the real lack of conflict. Now don't be fooled by big emotional scenes. That's not conflict, and it's ultimately not what makes a scene shine. 
Let's look at the character motivations. Daniel wants to convince Sam to do karate again. That makes sense, because in the Miyagi-verse, karate solves all problems. But Daniel also wants to help Sam out of her funk. And to do that, he wants to convince her to open up. That's okay, though they aren't exactly the same. Do you think if Sam opened up to him, but still didn't want to do karate, he would be okay with that? It's hard to believe that, even if you would like to imagine Father Daniel cares more about his daughter's well-being than karate instruction. Now what does Sam want? The most obvious answer seems to be that she wants Daniel to leave her alone. That's good in that it creates conflict in the scene. The problem is, it begs questions like, if that's what she wants, why did she go on this trip in the first place? She, and really any teenager, should be smart enough to read the situation. The dialogue tries to make it look like Daniel tricks Sam. I knew it. You knew what? Is that why you brought me here? To trick me into doing karate? But really, I find it hard to believe she could be so clueless, especially about her father. So where do we go? Well, deeper, obviously. If we move deeper in Sam's psyche, again, not something I would normally recommend, but if we move deeper, we will see maybe she wants Daniel to help her out. She wants to get better. It certainly makes the character more emotionally complex. That's fine, the problem is it undermines the whole scene. Daniel's motivation is to help Sam, and her motivation is to let her father help her. There's not much conflict in here. The only thing Daniel has to overcome is her teenage LaRusso stubbornness. That may have worked, except it just doesn't come off the page well at all. Imagine you were watching a show that has this scene between two characters. Tell me what's wrong. I don't wanna. Come on, tell me. Okay, you convinced me. Here's everything I think and feel. Okay, that's kind of a weird scene, right? Almost something you see in a comedy where the second character gives in despite no effort from the first. Now let's watch the supposed climax of this scene. Please, just help me to understand why. I want to help. It doesn't matter. You can't help. Yeah, I can't if you don't tell me what's going on. Be honest with me, Sam. I froze, okay? I watched my friends get hurt. So literally, the big moment in this scene, the line that gets Sam to open up and give Daniel the win, is be honest with me, Sam. He says that right after she says he can't help her, and then she just opens up, boom, Daniel wins. If we bring back this chart, you can see the similar character motivations and consequenting lack of real conflict creates a scene with little to no rising action. The climax is there, Sam opening up to him, but there's very little building up to it. After all the intro chatter, there is really only this moment. Wanna give it another shot for old time's sake? What do you say? I knew it. You knew what? Is that why you brought me here? To trick me into doing karate? The problem is this is also the turning point. It's where Daniel is finally moving towards what he really wants. A more accurate chart for this scene would look like this. It's very flat with only a few small steps up. So even if you like the climax, there was very little rising action or conflict in getting there. As I showed, it wasn't really much. It makes the whole scene flat. So if we jump ahead, we have this scene which suffers from an identity crisis. What I mean by that is even though it's normal to have multiple scenes come together in a sequence, each individual scene should stand on its own. This scene really feels like a repeat of the previous scene, in fact, it's like we start all over again with Daniel trying to convince Sam to talk. Remember this? Let's watch. Look, you don't have to talk to me. I just want you to know that I'm always here for you, all right? I told you, you can't help me. Why don't you walk me through what happened? When the fight started, I... I couldn't move. Yeah, same thing all over again. And Daniel wins again. Sam opens right up with zero effort. I think what would have helped these scenes shine a little more is if Sam gave Daniel more pushback. He really had to work to get her to open up. It's too easy for him. The biggest weakness is that the two climactic moments are almost identical to each other. Or it feels like it was one longer monologue split up. Watch this. I froze, okay? I couldn't move. I watched my friends get hurt. Miguel would fall, and Robbie would run. 
to meet you. I wanted to meet hurt. you, but his arm broken, and, and I couldn't do anything. I couldn't do to stop anything. It. And now I'm having all these panic attacks, and and I don't know if I'm ever going to be able to defend myself again. I'm scared, Dad. Now you can try and dig deep and say that this is something Sam needed to verbalize a few times to get out of her system and start to recover, and maybe that would be true. Except the fact that these scenes are literally back-to-back -back just reeks of bad writing. Moving on here, you really just see the same problem. The whole scene is just Daniel giving his little speech to Sam. What does she want in this scene? I would say she wants to learn how to be better or not be afraid anymore. So again, there's no conflict and not even the teenage stubbornness you have in the earlier scenes. Consequently, there's no drama. The scene is very flat. It's just Daniel talking and Sam looking. This may be a more personal quibble, but I don't like the comparison to Mike Barnes here. I've always felt Sam's fight with Tori was more like Daniel's fight with Chosen. Chosen was trying to kill Daniel. It's not tournament. It's for real. No, we fight to death. Tori was pretty much trying to do the same with Sam. There are no rules. Also, considering that Chosen was just in this season, you would think they would go with a lesson from there. Except that didn't happen. Honestly, the reason is probably because the movie skipped over Daniel's recovery from the Chosen fight. Karate Kid 2 ended, and then Daniel shows up at the airport good as new in Karate Kid 3. So this was a decision to use what they had and bring Mr. Miyagi into it, which I understand but feel like there were better directions to take the scene. While the end scene here does have my favorite line of the season, the scene itself is also pretty straightforward. Her story ends on a high note, it's like ending on a win for the characters. That makes some sense because of the rest of the episode ends on a dark note, but I think wrapping everything up so neatly creates a problem with Sam's story across the back half of the season. This moment here and then this moment here take away from the suspense and uncertainty here. You had no doubt Sam would get up because she had already gotten up before. Without going overboard on details, I do think they could have concluded the storyline with Sam getting back into karate without the picture-perfect, gift-wrapped with a bow on top happy ending. It keeps her trouble going and leaves the final fight in suspense. Now let's jump back to the beginning of the episode. This is an issue maybe as much with the writing as the directing. This scene has an awkward feel and that doesn't mean the awkwardness they're going for. It's in the morning before school. This is something we've seen a lot, actually. There's a certain feel to the LaRusso house mornings, but there's no breakfast, and also where's Anthony? You'd expect him to be there. There's a simple fix to this that can address the issues and allow the audience to grasp deeper into Sam's somewhat disturbed psyche via visual storytelling. Imagine this same scene, the same exact dialogue, except we shift the setting to Sam's room. Instead of Sam randomly walking into the kitchen with her parents weirdly sitting at the table, they come in her room carrying a cup of tea. Except something we would immediately notice is for the first time ever, her bed isn't perfectly made. It's a little messy. Maybe she has her school books around too, as she hasn't packed her bag yet. Those are just little visual clues that would immediately signal that Sam isn't well. Coming off the opening dream sequence, I think it would fit. Also, with Daniel and Amanda coming in her room, it really emphasizes that they are the ones pushing her. She would naturally push back. So instead of the scene ending with her getting up and leaving, like the original, she kicks her parents out of her room. We're not used to seeing Sam be hard on them. It's been a while, but it really conveys the emotional drain she's feeling. It also heightens the conflict for the whole storyline. So the later scenes have more conflict and higher stakes, helping with those problems. Also, problems like, where's Anthony? Just go away. It just goes away. You don't expect Anthony in Sam's room, so that question just disappears when you set the scene there. A lot of this starts with the writing, though honestly a good director should have picked up on that as well. So a very compelling and natural storyline which could have arced out over the back half of the season was instead crammed into one episode. The execution then was weak. Multiple key scenes had little conflict, creating almost zero rising action culminating in big scene climaxes that fall flat. As the story is wrapped up nicely, it hinders the suspense and uncertainty of the final fight. I'm certain this could have been done better. As I've said in other videos, there are parts of this episode I like, 
The Dimitri Yasmin storyline is very Hollywood, but fun. Some comedic parts, like Johnny looking for the dojo, are pretty worn out. Honestly, I knew where this joke was going, though that's common for me. If you enjoyed this deep dive breakdown, please drop a like and share the video. I appreciate everything. Please subscribe for more great analysis like this one. Up next, we're going to take a look at December 19th and specifically John Kreese, though we'll probably have a short detour on the way. Have a great day. I'll see you at the next watch party. What are you going to do? Break my arm too? You let that happen. I couldn't do anything.